Hello, everybody. I'm the Goju Ryu philosopher, and today I'd like to look into a cultural element of martial arts practice that a lot of people misunderstand. It's common for dojos in America, the UK, and other places to teach their classes in Japanese or to use Japanese terminology like os, onegaishimas, doitashimashite, or hajime. We call our coaches sensei, other students senpai or kohai, and we even wear gis and obis. Many karate dojos are steeped in both Japanese language and Japanese culture. However, what's the benefit of using all of these Japanese phrases in our training? There are plenty of dojos that trade out all the Japanese for the language that the students and the teachers speak natively. I have experience with both kinds of dojos and have learned a lot from each experience. Now, I'm a bit of an outlier since I've chosen to study Japanese outside of the dojo. As of the time this video is being written and released, I have completed third year Japanese at my college, which by no means makes me fluent, but puts my Japanese knowledge above that used in most dojos, even the ones that truly lean into Japanese cultural element. But even before starting to take Japanese as a class, I had been using the basic Japanese phrases of karate for over a decade. However, one of the dojos that I visit to train at during college runs classes almost entirely in English, with the names of katas being the only element of the Japanese language that remains. That dojo has produced some of the most talented martial artists I've ever met, one of whom even gave me corrections to kata that brought my training to a whole nother level. So today I'd like to explore whether we really ought to learn Japanese for our practice of karate. Does it bring a benefit to our training? If so, what is the benefit? And if not, why do so many people still insist on training that way? Let's get started. While karate is thought of as a culturally Japanese martial art, this is only a relatively recent phenomenon. Historically, the territory of modern Okinawa Prefecture was an independent country known as the Ryukyu Kingdoms. Originally three kingdoms, they were unified under the Shou Dynasty in 1429, and were soon thereafter recognized by the Ming Dynasty, who sent 36 Fujinese families to reside in the kingdom to facilitate both trade and cultural exchange. There are many theories about the origins of karate, which credit these families or this system of trade with China as the introduction of Di into Ryukyuan society. In 1609, the Japanese Satsuma Domain's forces, led by the Shimazu clan, invaded the Ryukyus from the north and established control over the kingdoms. The Satsuma allowed Ryukyu to remain its own nation and continue its tributary trade with China, but annexed the Amami Islands and mostly monopolized the economy and imports from the Ryukyus. Particularly lucrative was the trade in sugarcane and sweet potatoes, the latter of which are called Satsumaimo, or Satsuma potatoes, in Japanese to this day. After an incident in 1871, where several Ryukyuans were killed in Taiwan, Japan initiated hostilities with China, indicating their desire to claim sovereignty over the Ryukyu kingdoms. The next year, the kingdoms were annexed into Japan as the Ryukyu Domain. At a time when the Meiji reforms were abolishing the domain system and replacing it with prefectures, Ryukyu was created as a new domain in order to secure this territorial claim. After seven years, in 1879, Ryukyu Domain was reformed as Okinawa Prefecture. Because of this long and complex history, which I've only scratched the surface of, the indigenous martial arts of the Ryukyu kingdoms, which are now known as karate, are the cultural heritage not only of Japan, but also of an independent, proud, and often oppressed people. Ryukyuans have faced discrimination by the Yamato Japanese people from even before the Satsuma domination of the islands, and that discrimination still continues to this day. Famously, the Japanese attempted to eliminate knowledge of the Ryukyuan language, similar to American and Canadian treatments of indigenous people in North America. Also, during the close of the Second World War, Japanese command chose to sacrifice the lives of Ryukyuan civilians in the disastrous Battle of Okinawa. The Ryukyuan languages, known as Uchinaguchi, are currently endangered languages due to this period of brutal repression. Arguably, it would be more historically and culturally accurate to teach karate in Uchinaguchi than in Japanese, but for obvious reasons, this is unlikely to happen anytime soon. I'm actually beginning to study a little bit of Uchinaguchi based on several available resources, and it's an enlightening experience. Much of the written record of karate's history has been lost for various reasons, but by learning the Ryukyuan language, it may be possible to uncover some of this history. Many of the traditions that we currently expect when it comes to karate are fairly recent additions, products of Japanese regulation of the Ryukyuan people's history and culture. However, a great number of people were introduced to karate through the lens of Japanese culture. Even if it originally came from the Ryukyuan people, much has changed in the century and a half since Ryukyu's annexation. Is there a need to reject the modern history of karate and return to its distant roots? And if so, why not return even further to the Chinese arts that heavily influenced the development of tea in the first place? Ian Abernethy's concept of the martial map, which you'll hear me talk a lot about on this channel, divides martial arts largely into three areas, self-defense techniques, combat techniques, 
and cultural heritages. A single martial art can fit any role or combination of these roles, and people who come into the martial arts do so for these reasons as well. Many karateka were inspired to begin or to continue their training, at least partially because of its connection to Japanese culture. A lot of dojos really lean into this, and it can be an enriching experience for those who are looking for it. For this reason, I don't think that dojos that use the Japanese language should stop. However, there's no reason for dojos that don't use Japanese to start either. If your dojo is focused on self-defense or on teaching people how to fight, then using a different language doesn't deliver what the students come for. It may be useful for these dojos to make information about the Japanese names of techniques available, since much of the online resources use these terms, so that their students can have conversations with other martial artists without feeling left behind by a technical vocabulary, including the terms ukewaza and ashisabaki. However, saying gyakuzuki instead of reverse punch doesn't change the technique. For many students, the overuse of Japanese terms in the dojo may even lead to confusion. Worse, however, are the accidental problems that a culture of using Japanese in the dojo can bring about. Mik dojos, which are dojos that focus on making money at the expense of teaching effective techniques, can often use the cultural mystique of Japanese to fool students into believing that they're receiving real training. Owners of Mik dojos sometimes call themselves soke or hanshi, terms that most non-Japanese speakers don't know, to build an air of unquestionable authority and prevent themselves from receiving criticism. This also happens by accident, even when the dojo owner isn't attempting to grandstand. Since most Americans don't know the term sensei outside of martial arts, it can seem to denote a master whose techniques are perfect or unquestionable. Using a lot of Japanese can play into this expectation in unexpected ways. The term sensei itself just means person who came before in life, and native Japanese speakers use it for all sorts of teachers, as well as doctors and manga artists. However, unless you've lived in Japan or have really studied Japanese culture, you probably don't know these connotations. A further problem can arise when non-Japanese speaking karateka don't have the phonemes needed to correctly pronounce the terms that they insist on using. For instance, the phrase ki o tsuke is often used in the dojo to ask students to come to attention. This is a shorter form of the verbal phrase ki o tsukeru, which means more or less watch out or pay attention or even take care. However, certain dojos that I visited or researched have listed this term as chosuke, kitsuke, or kiske. While these are certainly okay transliterations of the way that even some Japanese speakers pronounce this command, since certain component sounds are often elided in colloquial speech, given enough time, a game of telephone is played that alters the sounds of the phrase until they're unrecognizable. This isn't a problem on its own, since as long as you know what the command means in the context of your dojo, you should be fine. However, this can result in it being difficult or impossible for members of one dojo to communicate or assimilate into another, since the phrases they use, which ought to be the same, often trip them up. If classes were taught in the native language of the students, this would probably be avoided. At the end of the day, there's no requirement that you learn Japanese for karate. However, if you would like to learn Japanese because karate inspired you, go ahead. It's a fun and rewarding experience, and it certainly doesn't detract from your training. I hope that this video offered a couple of perspectives, whether you prefer to use the Japanese terminology, keep it simple with your native language, or even adopt other newer traditions. The important thing is to always understand why you follow the traditions that you do. If you enjoyed this video, it would mean a lot if you could hit the like button. I'd also like to hear in the comments what language your dojo practice is in, and whether you're interested in learning Japanese, or even uchinaguchi, like I am. If you'd like to see more videos about the philosophy of martial arts, hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you know when I upload new content. This is a passion project with me, and I love that I am able to share that passion with all of you. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and Hontoni Gokansha Shimasu.